Good morning. My name is Zsuzsanna Osvát. I am director of the Holocaust Studies Program at UTD. And uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor John Cranwell uh, from Jesus College, Cambridge University, England. He is um, author of numerous wonderful books, among them bestsellers. And he is also considered to be uh, one of the greatest, um, if not the greatest, um, researcher and scholar of the Vatican and uh, the popes uh, of the 19th and 20th century. So I, without further delay, I would like to ask John Cranwell, please, to talk to us uh, about archival work in the Vatican. Uh, well, thank you very much, Shushi. Um, that was delightful, and, and good morning to you all. Um, I'm going to, uh, although this is a very formal setting, um, I would normally have liked uh, a meeting like this to be round a table in which we meet as equals and um, not with this big gap between us, but we'll do the best that we can in spirit. And what I'm going to do is uh, give you kind of rough um, directions and pointers and uh, a little information, and I'm going to break it up so that at the end of each segment, which and I'll tell you when we've reached the end of each segment, you can um, make observations or ask questions um, and uh, so that it's more of a conversation um, rather than um, a lecture. I hope you don't mind that. Um, I think in the first place uh, what I'd like to say, and I would quite like an observation on this um, from any of you who, who, who care to do so, is uh, the difficulty of the relationship between history and biography itself. And um, in, in, in Britain, this used to be called the um, Bad King John, Good Queen Bess theory of history, which is you know, the notion that you could uh, actually do history in this way. Um, and uh, I suppose, to an extent, um, it must be true with certain sorts of figures. I mean, if you take Hitler, for example, uh, Jared Diamond, in his last book, um, tells an extraordinary story about how Hitler escaped death on one of the autobahns by something like two millimeters when um, there was a car crash in which he was involved. And then ask the question, well, how would history have gone um, had he not, um, um, had he been killed on that particular occasion? Um, now, I think that with, in the case of a modern pope, uh, history and biography has another kind of complication, doesn't it? Because here is a person who believes that he is the vicar of Christ upon earth. And uh, there are millions of people in the world. During the time of Pius XII, there were, I think, 500 million Catholics. Um, now there are a billion Catholics uh, who subscribe more or less to this belief that their leader is the vicar of Christ upon earth. And so you have this extra um, spiritual dimension. Um, well, that's one segment. I mean, does, has anybody here got um, a, um, a burning question or thought about the way in which biography and history uh, work together and sometimes are in tension, sometimes clash? Yeah, good. Yes. How, how tough did they make it for you at, at, at the Vatican, and, and uh, how tough will it be in the future to, uh, to do a kind of unfettered uh, uh, biographical research? Yeah, well, I'm going to, that, that's a segment that's coming in a moment, and of course it's a very valid question and a very important one. 
Um, so, w well, what I would say is that if, you know, if there are no questions or thoughts from you about the um, relationship between biography and history, yes. On what the problem is? Yes. On what the problem is? Yes. Uh, well, uh, it's. I'll give you one instance of this. You know, what what is it that drives history? Is it um, individuals, or is it, um, you know, the trends in society, in economics, um, in com in communities? You know, collections of people, and uh, although individuals do. Uh, and so that raises this thought, you know, are, are the actions of one person really um, constrained and circumscribed by the community and the institutions and um, the societies in which they live? Um, so in other words, well, I, I mean, the, the problem as uh, defined by people like uh, Kerr back in 1960 in his very interesting little book, which um, I'm sure some of you have read, called What is History, um, you, you see those um, tensions um, mapped out for you. But as I said, you know, there is a, a special problem if this individual um, is regarded by, every, by so many millions of people in the world as being a very special individual, so that what he says, you know, carries, you know, the word of God or um, you know, special guidance from God. Bishop. Yes. In that regard, um, you spent a good time in, in the book um, about uh, the background, uh, the childhood and the early training of um, Eugenio Pacelli. Uh, and it's, it strikes me that, that the, it's almost a separate thing and from being vicar of Christ. And yet the two of them come together in sometimes fortunate and sometimes unfortunate ways. Yes. Uh, well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, perhaps I could give you an example of this, where, you know, strong religious belief connected with an individual who thinks he's the vicar of Christ um, actually can become a reading of history, a whole way of seeing history. On uh, May the 13th, 1917, um, in Portugal, at a place called Fatima, um, it is alleged that uh, the Virgin Mary appeared to three children. And um, she gave these three children three secrets. The first two were connected with the First World War and the Second World War. And uh, the third was a secret that was to be kept, according to the Virgin Mary, until 1960. And that's just recently been divulged by the present Holy Father. Now, uh, what the Fatima secrets are about, and they form almost a central part of papal thinking and papal ideology throughout the 20th century. Popes have given tremendous credence to this. You know, they really have believed that the Virgin Mary took time out of eternity to come and talk to these three children and tell them about the history of the 20th century. Um, what the central message is that um, unless uh, Catholics throughout the world pray to the Virgin Mary, then there will be wars and dissension and darkness over the earth. And you can see how this was related to the First World War, the Second World War, what happened in the Soviet Union. Um, now this gives you a, a very particular kind of view of history, that history is not what um, uh, is not about human responsibility within our communities and societies. It is to do with appeasement of the, um, the Virgin Mary, who stays the avenging hand of Jesus Christ. And um, the, um, well, so when one comes to deal with papal biography and how it fits in with history, um, this is a problem for the historian and the biographer, because uh, while on the one hand you must report this and say what the thinking is, not only of the individual pope, but of the many millions of people who follow him, um, you have to also try to 
understand the, the spiritual and subjective dimension of all these people who are involved in this. And that, um, what, what I'm illustrating here is another kind of tension and difficulty, what you're taking on with um, the biography of the Pope is uh, much more than a dispassionate objective history. If you report religion like, say, a, you know, anybody who gets involved with journalism, one of the first lessons you learn is to distinguish between opinion and reportage. Um, a historian um, uh, has the same kind of uh, discipline. Um, now, when you're reporting religion, you have to be aware all the time that um, while it's essential to be objective, if you miss out the spiritual dimension of, of belief and religious experience of the individuals you're describing, um, you are missing out something that's of crucial importance. Okay, well, well yes, hello. Thank you for that. There's history that may have been seen yeah. by a reporter, the sheep woman, and my biography would report that I went in mourning yesterday with an icon of the Virgin Mary as a symbol of suffering. It's well, the icon struck off. Okay, th yeah. thank you for sharing that experience with us. Um, I'd like to now move on to a particular problem of uh, researching um, popes in the modern period, and particularly this pope. Um, Pius XII, um, and that is that on the one hand he was an intensely private individual. Um, as far as we know, he didn't keep a diary. Um, his letters were of a personal nature, were very far, uh, few and far between. His younger sister, who was very close to him, Elisabetta, um, reported to the canonization tribunal that he very rarely wrote to her um, and um, so he was a, a very introverted individual extremely careful and has left as far as we know very few rem rem literary remains um, what we do have are some rather wooden essays that he wrote as a child in school they've been put together only published in German for some extraordinary reason. Um, not, very in, not very enlightening, not very exciting for the uh, biographer. Uh, but to add to that problem, there is the protocol of um, uh, the, the archives of recent popes. And the way it works is that um, it's five popes back. Everything that, um, so how, let's see now. Um, you can read nothing um, after the death of Benedict the, the 15th, and that is in 1922. And of course, that's a prodigious um, period of time, um, nearly 80 years now. Um, in which you completely draw a blank. And that's on every level of foreign diplomacy, all his acts and um, 
special letters in relation to um, liturgy, theology, and so forth. And uh, I think that um, while on the one hand um, it's understandable, what, what, what the Vatican says is that it's extremely expensive. The, these archives are prodigious, but, and it's extremely expensive to keep up with um, you know, the editing process, and that is why it is so delayed. But um, uh, I find that very difficult to accept because I'm sure that had the, if they were to raise an appeal, that um, the money would be forthcoming to assist them with this process. So um, uh, I, can't, I can't really accept that that's a valid argument. But of course, it puts us into great difficulty. Um, so what do we have in the way of uh, official documents? Well, in 1964, Paul VI, in response, I think, to um, a lot of questions and criticisms of the Vatican, um, uh, the way the Vatican behaved during the war, um, released the wartime documents. But in fact, they didn't release the wartime documents. What they did was to publish them. Um, nobody has ever seen these documents except the four Jesuit editors who were involved in that process. So between 1965 and 1982, 11 volumes of documents between 1939 and 1945 uh, were published by the Vatican in Rome. And um, the, it, it's a rather curious, um, not entirely professional um, editing process. It, it, all the apparatus is in French, um, which I suppose was done because that was the diplomatic language. And there have been some quite serious questions as to whether um, there are or there aren't omissions in these documents, which would therefore invalidate the whole project and cast doubt upon it. And uh, you, you may be aware that in recent weeks, the commission that was set up to uh, really uh, to, to make some comment on the role of Pius XII during the war has resigned. And it's resigned because there are questions about these published documents um, have not met with um, satisfactory answers. I have to say that in, you know, there was a great deal of publicity when the commission was set up, the three Jewish scholars and three Catholic scholars. Um, there was a great deal of publicity about how the Vatican were opening up the archives. That's how it was put at the press conference when it happened. Th this, in fact, was um, uh, a great insult to historical scholarship because what happened was that they were simply handed these 11 volumes at a ceremony, 11 volumes of published material. I mean, I'd had those volumes, you know, sitting on my desk at home you know, for a number of years. I mean, there was nothing, you know, and most decent libraries had them. So what was it they were giving to the commission? Absolutely nothing at all. Um, just to take one, um, just to take one example of an, of an omission, in um, 1942, um, in the spring of 1942, a man called um, Gerhard Rigner, who worked for the um, World Jewish Congress, collecting information on deportations um, throughout Europe, had sent a, an extended um, cable to the Pope via the Papal Nuncio in Switzerland, in which he set out all the facts and figures of deportations as he knew them, but um, singling out in particular countries where the Pope uh, um, had a special influence because they were Catholic. Croatia was an example of this, France was an example of this, Slovakia was an example. And the result was absolutely nothing. Nothing happened as a, as a result of that cable. Um, but amazingly, uh, the cable is missing from um, the volumes. 
But we know that they had this uh, um, aid memoir cable because of uh, certain footnotes which indicate that they knew about it. So there's an internal evidence in the documents to show that um, uh, it was there. <coughs> and um, the Vatican has never satisfactorily explained um, this, although the, uh, the press office just recently, when they were pressed about this question, said, well, um, we thought it was um, pointless to publish the aid memoir because it had already been published in uh, Saul Friedlander's um, uh, excellent collection, um, which actually blew the whistle on this whole subject back in 1965. But how absurd to say, you know, that you, know, that you would not um, allow your documents to be comprehensive because one of them had been published elsewhere. I mean, it's just absolutely not, it's not an excuse at all. Okay. Um, well, uh, do I have any observations or questions simply so far on, on this? Yes? Um, withheld, I would probably withheld. say, yes. Um, this is the one that worries me the most. Um, I, um, you know, it's, well, once you get involved in the Vatican, um, you realize that, um, in the first place, they don't all think alike. You know, they're, they've all got minds and aims and agendas of their own. They're not wicked people. M most of them are very good religious people. Um, but um, also there's enormous incompetence. I, I, I ought to explain that the great famous, um, it's called the Archivio Secreto, which really means the private archive of the popes, is run by professionals. Most of its holdings are in medieval and Renaissance manuscripts. And um, that is open to all competent and uh, proper scholars, and it is properly run. The material, the modern material, which relates to um, uh, diplomacy is in the archive of the Secretariat of State. And that's a different kettle of fish. That's run by Jesuits, uh, some of whom overlap with the gentlemen who, Jesuits who are involved in making um, Pius the Twelfth a Saint. Um, perhaps I should move on then swiftly to what I did get out of the archives. Um, so, you know, it's shut up to, uh, apart from the wartime archives, which of course are published and I make great use of those in the book, the um, archival material uh, pre-1922, which relates to Pacelli, starts in about 1913 when he was involved as the Under Secretary of State uh, negotiating a concordat with the Serbs. And as I explain in the book, the concordat with the Serbs, because it put the Austrians' noses out of joint, because they had had a sort of protectorate over Catholics in Yugoslavia, um, added to the tensions which um, were, um, which obtained um, just around the time of Sarajevo and the beginnings of the First World War. So all that was extremely interesting. Um, then we get into the First World War and um, he, we find a lot of material relating to Pacelli where he was involved in finding displaced persons and was very busy and his work there I think was very good. Then in 1917 he becomes Papal Nuncio in um, uh, Germany. Um, we find all the material relating to his visit to the Kaiser. Um, his, uh, uh, when the papal nunciature was under attack during the Bolshevik uprising in 1919. And um, so on through to 1922, well, one of the most interesting um, uh, incidents up to 1922 is when he's involved with the selection of uh, a new bishop, Archbishop for Cologne. And there you see for the first time the application of the new Code of Canon Law, the 1917 Code of Canon Law, um, 
in, in which it is the Pope and only the Pope who is going to say who that bishop is, and then a tremendous row breaks out um, with the local canons of the cathedral and indeed um, the state of Prussia in which um, Cologne was situated um, because uh, they too expected to have some kind of approval of the, the new archbishop. And all that material is there in the archives, and I was able to use, therefore, priming material, fresh material, which, as far as I could see, nobody else had exploited before ever. Um, and uh, all that did was really increase my frustration that there was that terrible shut-off point at 1922, and then it's all silent. Any observations on, on that? Bishop, yes. No, no, from 1922 to 1939, when you get the wartime published documents, you know, which are available, there's nothing. You can't, you can't get anything. Yeah. In fact, there's another area which I found very distressing, which is absent. Um, the, in, in the first decade of the 20th century, there was uh, um, uh, a campaign known as the Anti-Modernist Campaign, in which Pius X, the Pope of the time, um, uh, attacked uh, new theology and new thinking in theology. And uh, for some extraordinary reason, well, I, it's not an extraordinary reason, but it's extraordinary by their own rules, uh, there is nothing in the available from the appropriate archive from 1903, which is when it starts. So they actually break their own rules to you know, withhold stuff to suit themselves. Can I ask another yeah. Are these documents uh, available to the beatification or canonization committee that's doing that investigation? Uh, yes, they are. Um, but how well? I mean, I for about two years I went to see three or four times a week the man, Fa Father Gumpel, he's called, he's a Jesuit, who's in charge of that process. And we would talk for two or three hours about Pius Twelfth, And I, I was quite convinced that there were huge gaps in his... Um, I want to say at this point, it's a good question to raise, that um, the process of um, defining um, the holiness of the life of a, an individual who's going to be a saint is a form of biography making. It's, it's called a positio, and it's huge. I mean, in the case of Pius XII, it will run probably to a million words, and it will have cost a million dollars to put together. Um, and um, the, you, you can't read it. It's not available to be read, this positio, until after the, the individual has been beatified. If he's not beatified, it's not published. You know, you, you cannot get access to it. Um, sorry, there was, yes. Well, in, in the case of the Rigner, Gerhard Rigner um, memoir, and he, he's written, um, I don't know, Zhuzhi, whether you've read his book, um, um, what is it? Um, you know, Don't Give Up Hope, basically, the title is. It's, it's only published in French. But um, uh, he, he's a very good man and a tremendously honest man. And um, as he describes it, it's, uh, it's a document of huge embarrassment because <coughs> he knows now, as he knew at the time, this is uh, Rigner, that there was no reason why the Pope shouldn't have exerted an influence over those countries which were particularly Catholic. You know, I mean, Tiso was a Catholic priest. Croatia was a Catholic fascist state. You know, the bishops used to sit in the parliament with Pavelic. And so there was no reason why he shouldn't have put in a word to pressurize, you know, in the case of Croatia, 400,000 Serbs, Jews, and Gypsies were murdered in the most terrible uh, sort of situations. Um, and um, so uh, it, it, I guess the motive would be acute embarrassment in retrospect. It doesn't fit with, you know, the... Uh, 
And that, you know, that raises a question about, you know, two kinds of biographer, you know, me as a secular biographer and Father Gumpel as a biographer for canonization. You know, the, the two mentalities, the motivations are completely um, different. And um, it, I, I think that from a scholarly point of view, it, it must be tainted. Um, it's curious, you know, that uh, several years ago they changed the rules of canonization and gave up on um, a process which they've had since, well, certainly since um, the Enlightenment, which was to have an advocate who is popularly known as the devil's advocate, um, who brings, you know, an argument against this. That's, that's been <laughs> disestablished. Um, and um, so it's left to the consciences of individual witnesses to um, come forward and um, say, you know, what, they, what evidence they may have against the process. It was discontinued by this pope early in his reign. And he also made another change, which was to, uh, to, to ask for only one miracle. You know, you have to have a, a miracle which proves that God is approving of the saintliness of this person. It used to be two miracles were required, now it's only one. So it's part of the kind of general inflation of the um, process. Well, per yeah. Was it three, my dear? Yes, okay. Yeah. I have a question. Can you please wait? Um, you mentioned that he didn't keep a diary as far as we know and didn't write a lot of personal letters. Yeah. Do you think that was just part of his nature or do you think he was keeping an eye towards his canonization? <laughs> and if so, do you think he did a good enough job? <laughs> um, well, you know, he did, I, I think he did conduct himself towards the end of his life, as if he was expecting canonization. Um, he wasn't uh, reluctant, you know, to publicize the fact, first of all, that he had had visions of the Virgin Mary or, and um, Jesus Christ and a special spinning sun which was involved with, which was connected with the Fatima cult. Um, and he wasn't particularly worried, uh, or, or at least he welcomed the news that somebody had, um, uh, I, don't, I think it was an item of his clothing or something like that had been instrumental in performing a miracle of healing. He was quite happy with that notion. Um, so that's the answer to that question. I think probably towards the end of his life, he had uh, sort of ideas of grandiosity of that kind. Uh, but when he was younger, I, I doubt whether that was the motive. Um, I mean, much as I dislike the individual um, and find him um, kind of certainly remote from humanity, uh, I think he did strive very hard to be a, a good person. And, um, you know, he did have this spiritual life. And uh, I think it was simply that he wasn't a person of great feeling. You know, I mean, I think that to write kind letters to your siblings you know, um, is a sign of empathy. But you see, he'd been brought up on this thing, called the, this book called The Imitation of Christ, and it expresses a certain kind of spirituality which um, really comes, I think, more out of, although The Imitation of Christ was 15th century, I think, um, the, the, the spirituality he expressed was sort of 17th, 18th century, and it was the idea that you could have uh, a spirituality that is funneled straight up to God without any contact, you know, in your, you know, in your community of people and family. Um, and that comes out of a, of a revived notion that you find coming in and out of theology um, from the sort of early Middle Ages, I think, which uh, sees a human being as uh, a body-soul dualism. Um, the, the most important thing about you is your soul, and that can connect straight up to God spiritually, and the body and the physical reality, and therefore the um, community reality, um, is reduced and has less meaning.
Right, so. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, uh, well, have you been a Catholic for a long time? Yeah, yes, I am a Catholic now. You yes. Are Catholic. And I did, I, I had a, <laughs> I started to be a priest for seven years. Uh, and then I became an agnostic for 20 years, and I returned to the faith about 12 years ago. Uh, could you tell me, does the Pope sin by omission or commission? I didn't attend the lecture yesterday. Okay. Um, well, can, can I, can I, I, I don't often do this, but it, that's such a long question to answer. The answer is omission, the short question, but it's all in my book, so Get the paperback, it's very cheap. <laughs> yes, Harry. Can you tell us what sort of proportion of popes usually get canonized? In other words, did this pope have a reasonable expectation to be a candidate and therefore during his life to behave in such a way as to eventually merit this promotion? Yeah. Um, well, in the modern, uh, actually, there are not a great many popes who are canonized. I mean, you've got to go a long way back really, but in the modern period, um, the outstanding example is Pius X, which in retrospect now, I mean, he was a very charismatic, holy person, a man of great prayer. He brought in frequent um, attendance at the Eucharist. In fact, you know when you see all the little girls and boys making their first communion, that was all, that's an invention of the modern period of Catholicism. It has no tradition beyond the first decade of the 20th century, and it was invented by Pius X, who, because the normal age of making your first communion was 13 or 14, and he said, no, let's bring it in at the beginning of the age of reason at seven, and that, and he advocated frequent communion, which meant frequent confession. And, the, you know, a lot of what we think to be typically Catholic traditions actually are skin deep, they're not very old, and they didn't last very long because, you know, since Vatican II, many of them have disappeared. Um, okay, so you have Pius X, very controversial now because he was the Pope who persecuted uh, Catholic modernists. Modernists was his word, and it was a term of abuse. Um, and so it's interesting that this pope, John Paul II, um, intended last year to canonize John, Paul, uh, John the Twenty-Third and Pius the Twelfth. Um, he, many people think, um, and I mustn't get grandiose myself, that my book had a lot to do with the postponement of Pius the Twelfth, because there would have been such an outcry, you know, in, in the light of the sort of information that was coming out. So he substituted Pius IX, who himself, I mean, is a, was a tremendous anti-Semite. And if you want to get, um, if you're interested in Pius IX and um, just how wrong-headed uh, a beatification process is, you should read, well, first of all, um, Edgar, the kidnapping of Edgar de Mortara by David Kurtzer. And now he's written a new book, um, which is called um, The Papacy and anti-Semitism. <coughs> so um, that's the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, right at the back? Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear me correctly last night to say that those papers from 1922 to 1939 will eventually be open to the public? Well, they should be open to the public on the death of John Paul II. Okay. So in that sense, they're not being kept back by any conspiracy, but it's just the way they do stuff. Yeah. Yes. Well, the theory is that these, you, you, the background is the, you know, what happened at the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council was a reaction to um, a long period of popes who had been great centralizers, you know, who were, and who had used exploited canon law to um, exert papal authority top down. Second Vatican Council was um, in reaction to that, and uh, the, with John the Twenty Third, and it, it sought a much more collegial church in which the church authority, teaching authority, spiritual authority was shared with the bishops, 
which of course is a tradition that goes back to the early Christian church, although there's always been this tension between the two sides. Um, what we've seen under John, this pope, John Paul II, is a return to that top-down, non-collegial church. And so, you know, coming up, as he must know now, he hasn't got long to live, to beatify two popes um, who, um, you know, uh, no, let, 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 let me get this right, to everybody wanted John XXIII to be beatified because he was obviously a very holy and saintly man. But he was determined to beatify him alongside Pius XII in order to say, well, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not giving up on a centralized church. And having been forced by public opinion not to do it, then he brings in this Pius IX, who you know, was the originator of uh, papal, you know, the dogma of papal infallibility and um, papal primacy. So that's the kind of politics of it. Yeah. Uh, Gigi. Um, I, I just have this one huge problem about yeah. 850,000 Jews. Yeah. Since there is no proof for that, <coughs> it was the utterance of one person. Mm. And then for some political or other reasons, Yad Vashem then created this, uh, this put this notion into, into um, the icon of the path of the righteous. Yeah. This number, which is 100%, not proved by anyone, that is a bogus, a totally bogus number. How come that we don't go back somehow to the very person who said that first and look for the reasons. I mean, if you go from country to country, we know exactly the numbers, we know exactly what happened. This is like, you know, to say that, uh, you know, the, 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 the Dalai Lama saved uh, 400,000 Jews. I mean, he somehow did it. Yeah. Uh, and somehow Pius the first did not save that number. He might have saved a certain amount of Jews, mm. but this 850,000 or 40,000, I don't know exactly, is a bogus number. How come that, I mean, that we don't come back to this, that we don't try to, to search for this? Yeah, but it, it's, it's a very good question, and it worried me deeply at the time when I was writing the book. You know, how many did he save? How many could he have been said safely to have saved. And uh, I decided to, I mean, I, uh, I, do, I don't know where it comes from. Um, I didn't have the time or the opportunity because I had other fish to fry when I was writing this biography. Um, but what I did in my own mind, and I, I mean, I report that number in the book, and I don't cast doubt on it either. I simply say, this is reported. And um, what I tried to do all the way through was to you know, give a sense of balance of what this person's saying, what that person's saying. Um, I guess what influenced me, and um, I won't have time to talk about it now because we're, you know, well, we've got another 10 minutes, but um, when one is assembling um, a, a bibliography um, in preparation for such a biography, um, it's, um, well, you, I mean, there's a whole s set of different kinds of books that one's going to include, you know, on theology, on canon law, church history, and so forth. But uh, what's very interesting is to trace the history of the different treatments of the reign of Pius XII um, from... Um, I guess 1963, when the famous play by Hockuth um, was um, put on in New York and um, London, um, which was the origin of the first great attack against the myth. Now, as you work, what, what then happens is that you have um, a whole series of books which are having conversations with each other, or in some respects, shouting and screaming at each other. I mean, the next book, which I think is very dispassionate and, and a wonderful book by a great scholar, is um, Saul Friedlander's book of the documents of Pius XII. And it's mostly documents which he's 
managed to get, he couldn't get them from the Vatican, of course, but he got them from diplomatic sources. Um, but eventually you come to um, books which really create a great difficulty. And, and the, I, I think the first book, the first mention of the 850,000, I think is in Pinchas Lapide, which I think is about 1970. And um, Pinchas Lapide was an Israeli consul in Milan. And this puts you in a difficulty because there is a, a kind of tradition of books or commentaries on Pius XII, which are by Jews. And <coughs> I think what I decided in my mind was, when I looked at the sort of comments which were made from the death of Pius XII, you know, Golda Meir talked about him as being a wonderful person who saved Jews and so forth, is that um, this was probably part of a a desire to, first of all, heal relationships with the Vatican very quickly in order to get the Vatican on side um, to um, accept the State of Israel. And um, <coughs> that's, that's the best I can say, that's the best answer I can give. Um, but of course one would doubt that uh, Pius XII saved individually the lives of 850,000. But I prefer, you know, for the sake of all the arguments that go backwards and forwards, not to get stuck in that, because you never get out of it otherwise, you know, it's, um, yeah, please. Uh, speaking of the dialogue between different articles and books, mm. in, in the February 26, 2001 issue of Weekly Standard by, I believe, Rabbi David Dowell, he made he had two main points. First, he uh, contended that Pius XII should be declared a righteous Gentile for his role in saving, as he put it, again, the Pinchas Lapid figure of 860,000 verse 5. Yep. He also was particularly critical of your scholarship uh, and some others, such as James Carroll, mm. saying that there's, there's a separate issue going on here. There's disaffected or ex- or anti-Catholics who wish to use, in his words, Pius XII or any stick, as he put it, to beat the current papacy, the current Vatican hierarchy. Second, and that was the second point. In the uh, current issue of Commentary Magazine, Kevin Madigan has an article in which he does not agree with Rabbi Dowling on the righteous Gentile issue, but he again says he is particularly critical of your scholarship and says that basically puts you in the camp of a, a disaffected Catholic looking for a stick to be the Pope with on issues such as birth control, women's ordination, particularly Catholic issues. Uh, one, I wish, I wish can, can, can I just do it? I think that, that's enough for well, that, that, that's enough for the next you know five minutes. Um, the, uh, the, the article that appeared in the standard, I, I think um, is representative. I, I mean I would hate to stand up here and pretend that I had received nothing but plaudits from everybody who'd reviewed my book or commented on it. Um, and uh, so there you are. You know that is part of the pluralism of history. You know that we can all disagree with each other. Um, if the disagreement is the status of my Catholicism rather than you know the evidence that I bring, you know, let, does the good rabbi say, well, you know, these facts were wrong. These facts, you know, th this document was mistranslated. No, he doesn't. He's taking an overview and seeking some kind of explanation for my interpretation of a set of, uh, of, of, of facts and evidence. Now, it's interesting that um, he should lump me together with Carol, because Carol is an ex-priest. Uh, I'm an ex-seminarian. And there's been a, a long tradition uh, within my church. Are, are you a Catholic, by the way? Yeah. There's been a long tradition within the Catholic Church um, <coughs> of condemning inside critics, internal critics, um, as being uh, in some way bitter, the person that bit the hand that fed them, the fallen angel kind of syndrome. In my case, it's been taken to an extreme that for a period, uh, because it worried me, it almost brought me to the verge of a mental breakdown because uh, I was accused of 
pretending to be a Roman Catholic in order to get an unwanted hearing from Catholics inside the church. Now, if that were true, I mean, I would be virtually a diabolical kind of person. And um, I, I've got over it now. I mean, one has to, and one gets on and moves on. But uh, I think that, you know, th the idea that criticism from within has got to be labeled in this kind of way um, indicates a certain kind of culture, which is one that, you know, is not going to put up with any kind of diversity. You know, it's fear. You know. I don't care what they are. I mean, he, I mean, why is he using that as an argument? You know, I mean, it's an extremely ab ominous approach. Now, no, I, I, I'll just say that you had a second question, which was, I your, your, hmm? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I wanted to say a word of quote here. Um, after the event yesterday, I had a two-hour conversation with one of our local priests at a coffee shop. And mm. I made the point, because I've been in disagreement with local management here about an issue, I made a point that we're quite loyal as Catholics when we disagree with authority. That's more loyal than just staying on the side and going with the flow. So I would say that to yeah. try to ferret out the truth is a, is a, is a kind of sign of loyalty to truth in, in the church and its operation. Yeah, good. Yep. A brief question. You mentioned yesterday that there is a Catholic nun who was denounced for going to a conference on women in the church. Sister Joan Chichester. Yeah. Have you had any official comment from the Pope or whoever has, have you been denounced? Has your work been denounced or has it, there been silence? Uh, yes, very much so. I was denounced on the front page in journalism we call the splash, the main headline, in the Osservatorio Romano, um, in six languages. Um, the headline ran something like, author admonished. But it's interesting that the, the, the specific quarrel with me had absolutely nothing to do with the arguments or the evidence. It was that, um, and they actually said, John Cornwell has no doctorates in canon law, theology, or church history, and therefore readers should be put on their guard, you know, that they should, you know, uh, take no notice of this book. That, that's what it actually said on the front page of the official Vatican newspaper. Um, and there was some other nonsense about how, uh, and this had appeared in a newspaper, but, I mean, the, uh, uh, actually this is appropriate for talking about the archives. When I went to the Secret Secretariat of State archives, I, um, <coughs> uh, no, 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 it's right. Um, um, I spent a month there. It's uh, a special reading room in the Borgia Tower in the Vatican. It's a tiny room with um, very poor lighting. There are just six desks, and you go through into another room, and there are six um, lavatory cubicles, and that's because sometimes you have to be locked in with your documents, and in case you're taken short, they have to guarantee that everybody will be able to. Um, and um, so in consequence, I photocopied absolutely everything I could lay my hands on, or ordered photocopies at a, a dollar a page. I came away from Rome with you know, about $1,000 worth of things. And did my research back in Cambridge, you know, in proper light and not sitting in a basement. And incidentally, too, the, the, you know, most, uh, this Vatican archive is shut at one o'clock every day, and always shut on feast days and, um, you know, Sunday, obviously. So that was the way I did it. Now, um, a newspaper report had said that I studied the documents in the Secretary of State for months on end, which was essentially true. You know, this was a result of an interview with me. They checked back to their files and found that I had only been in the archive for a month, and so I was pilloried as a liar by the Vatican um, because of the discrepancy between these two facts. But that, you know, that is the level um, of the standard of the kind of criticism I've had from the official church. Yep. I'm not justifying uh, that Pope was not, or that he's sitting by commission, or only should I just say. But when I consider today 
what has happened in Eastern Europe, the killing of many, many, many Muslims. And none of us cry out the way we should. Now, uh, I'm wondering if it's human nature that we all keep quiet instead of standing up and fighting against what is really unjust and immoral. Do you have an answer to that? No, I don't. No, I don't. Bishop, I think Bishop has an answer. Thank you. <laughs> Jews or Christians will respond to their faith, other times they will not. The greater responsibility, and I think Jesus had something to say about this, falls upon those who have the authority to say something and don't. And I think if you're a bishop or a priest or a, or a pope, and, and you have the opportunity to say something and don't, your sin of omission may be a great deal greater than Nancy Sotomayor's sin of omission. Pius XII actually said during the war that um, at one of his um, allocutions to a group that um, had he as the Vicar of Christ not said a candid word about atrocities, then um, you know, he would have something deeply to be ashamed of and something on his conscience. And um, I think you know, a lot of uh, commentators have come back to that particular moment and uh, uh, as I you know to be quite honest in you know one does change one's views as a result of writing a book you know you write a book you research it in time and when uh, I mean my book has been published in 14 countries and it's been literally um, you know stood the test of thousands of reviews and um, I to this day, I get a big post bag every week of people who, you know, want to give me their view, and um, so of course one one changes one's views. And I I have to say that you know at the at, at the end of this process that um, we'll probably go on talking about the merits of Pius the Twelfth, you know, till the end of time because you cannot enter into this person's soul into his conscience and I think that during the war period which was such an extraordinary time um, a world war that um, you could certainly find all kinds of mitigating reasons for his silence and I think they're quite genuine um, but um, uh, and perhaps in my book I could have done more to have stressed that mitigation but um, on the other hand as time has passed, um, I find that the focus of events in 1933, when he did the special treaty with Hitler, um, is something I, I, I find that my um, criticism of him becomes um, ever deeper with the passage of time. Okay.